And at the time, I really just didn't care what I ate. I'd taken the expert advice. There's nothing I could do about it. The, it doesn't matter what you eat because it's not going to affect the, the cancer either way. I even had advice that you know, junk food is actually good for cancer because it, there's no nutrients to feed the cancer. You know, it's ridiculous nonsense like that. That's some of the advice that we, I got from the hospital. And even while going through treatment, when again, they, like, they'll bring trolleys of food around and it's all candy and cakes and, and soda drinks. And even the, the hospital food itself, when you're in overnight, the meals, the so-called meals, are all carbohydrates, like pancakes, and there'd be no meat at all, just sugar. And I used to joke about it at the time, they feed us this stuff so they can kill us off quickly. At the time, it was just a joke, but looking back now, I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure that's what they're trying to do, you know. <laughs> you have to fight, you have to really argue with yourself, like, get your ass off the, off the lounge, get up, go to the gym, you know, go outside, get some sunlight, go for a run, do whatever. I think we all go through that struggle, you know. I think the difference is that some, some people lose that battle. But me, I, I will go to war with myself, you know, I get up and, and move. These things have to be done. The simplest answer is that I just, I still have things I want to do. I'm not just going to give up and say, oh, I, I can't do them. Whether I get them done or not, I'm going to keep trying to, get, to do them. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Nia M. Nova podcast. I'm really happy to be sitting down with DC. His channel is DC Learning to Live on YouTube. And I've sort of recently, uh, well, I've been following your channel for a while, but I've recently kind of been watching more of your videos um, and really getting interested in your story. It's quite, it's quite a story. And uh, I think where you are now is so inspiring. And so I wanted to have you on to just kind of discuss all of that and um, share share how you found the carnivore diet, how that's going for you, where you are on your, your health journey, and any advice you have for people who may be struggling with similar uh, issues as you had yourself. So I'd love if we could just kind of start there and, and give us uh, your health background and, and how you got to carnivore. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, that's you know. Thanks very much for having me on. And uh, yeah, I, I really like some of the, the content you've been putting out too. It's been it's been really good. Um, for me, finding the carnivore diet um, has been a very long journey. Actually, um, this all started, I I guess back in two thousand eleven, where I, when I was living in Japan. Um, in March 2011, we were hit by a nine magnitude earthquake and then the tsunami afterwards. And after that, we sort of we spent the rest of that year trying to rebuild and um, recover and trying to survive. We spent a lot of time sort of just trying to find food and that sort of stuff, like after natural, just trying to survive the natural disaster. But I was having trouble with uh, my health at the same time. And leading up to that, I was uh, I was having troubles with colds and flus, and my immune system was very very weak. Um, I, I I really sort of put everything down to just getting older, you know. Like I was almost thirty eight at the time, and I was I was thinking, you know, I'm starting to slow down and that sort of thing. Um, you know, when, when I was out coaching, I, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, so. I spent a lot, a lot of time with athletes and uh, a lot of them much younger than me. And when I couldn't keep up with them, I, was, I, th I was just figured I was just getting old. And um, But after spending 2011 trying to recover and trying to rebuild my business and trying to get things back in back into place after the earthquake, we um, well, I decided to go back to Australia or come back to Australia to visit my family because, you know, for no other reason really just to show them that I was fine and everything was good. But when I got here, I was sick, um, like the, the trip. I went from, like in Japan, it was minus two degrees when I left. When I got to Australia, like the next day, it was uh, 32 degrees Celsius. So it was a, quite a big temperature difference. And when I got off the plane, I, I could feel a flu coming on. 
So uh, again, I just put it down to the, the weather and the, the traveling and that sort of stuff. But I decided to have a checkup. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that sort of took, this sort of took a few weeks to, you know, I had a blood test done. He was worried about my, my blood markers and, and uh, things like that. But I did a few tests and um, in January, when I was supposed to go back to Japan, um, I was supposed to, I was only here for a two week vacation, really. But um, on the day I was due to go back to Japan, I, I was asked to go to the hospital in, in the city here in Australia, in Brisbane. And um, they told me that I had a very high stage four cancer. Um, after a few tests, uh, about a week, uh, probing and all that sort of stuff. Um, they told me it was a kind of a, a rare type of cancer that um, for my age group is called follicular lymphoma. It's a recurring type of blood cancer that um, starts in your lymphatic system. And the best I could hope for would be a remission period. Um, there's no cure that will come back. It's kind of a catch-22. The more you treat it, or the more severe it is, the more treatment you need, but the more you treat it, the the more aggressive it becomes and it returns. And sometimes it might even change the type of cancer later on. So it was a very um, negative sort of outlook straight from the start. Um, but it, the other trouble I was having was that because it was a very high stage four, I had an external, I had a, apart from the lymphatic system, I had a very large tumor wrapped around my aorta and it was sitting on top of my kidneys and, and crushing other organs around it. So um, it actually killed my left kidney and it shrunk down to pretty much nothing. And my right kidney was down to just 12% flow capacity. So it was at this point, it was a race between the cancer and the, the kidneys as to who was going to kill me first. But at, at the start, it was they gave me pretty much about 2% chance of making maybe the next two, maybe on the outside three months. Um, before, you know, so before I could even have chemotherapy for treatment i had to have operations on my kidneys to get them going again to keep them flowing um in the end they couldn't get their left kidney going but uh the right kidney after quite a few uh we, we put stints in to open them up open up the flow in that but uh that would you know that took years years more of uh, operations as well so from there um that was in january 2012 that meant that i couldn't go back to japan i couldn't keep my own i've been living there for 10 years and uh, my wife she's japanese um at the time she couldn't stay in australia she had work as well um and she had to go back to japan and, and pretty much sell and give away everything we couldn't keep uh, our home business car you know everything that you have in life that you, you work towards we had to give up um and that, that was really tough actually because it was it wasn't i mean it's, it's difficult enough when you know a doctor tells you that yeah okay you've only got months to live without treatment um but when they tell you like you've you've lost when they give you that kind of diagnosis, like I've just lost my entire life in Japan as well. So everything I've worked for and I just have to give up. Um, and of course my wife had to as well, which was really difficult for me to sort of um, come to terms with as well. And then she had to go back and do all that, which would take uh, several months. And then he gave me a few months to live. So we weren't sure if we were ever going to see each other again at that time. So um, that left me going through treatment, you know, just losing everything. I was stuck in hospital because I didn't have anyone to, or I didn't have a home to go to. 
and I didn't have anyone to take me home and take care of me. So I was stuck in hospital. And um, then, you know, I was going through all these operations for my kidneys and then had to start chemotherapy. And it was a particularly heavy dose chemotherapy because when you're at very high stage four, they have to be very aggressive with the, with the treatment as well. Um, and so we, we did um, what was called arch off. And I mean, because it's an inoperable uh, disease, because it's, it's in, when it starts in your lymphatics, it's in your blood, in your blood, in your, in your blood marrow and everything. So in multiple organs, um, so they can't operate on anything. They couldn't cut the tumor out. They just had to try and shrink it down. Um, so um, our shop is uh, like an acronym. So it's like five different uh, bags of treatment for each session. And that was done over eventually like a start on a, like a 10 hour infusion. And then eventually like it gets down to a four hour infusion as you get used to it. Um, and that was that was horrible it was a really horrible treatment left you with a lot of side effects um a lot of organ damage inside so i had a lot of digestive issues ibs um, ulcers and many other side effects violent vomiting and things like that as well and that went on for eight treatments so that was that was really. I thought at the time that was that was um, probably the worst thing I had probably ever been through. So um, when that finished, it, it had, uh, cleared up all my blood and it put me into a stage two remission. So like a state, like I brought me back to a stable stage two, and that was pretty much as good as it was um, supposed to get, I guess. Uh, they, were, they were happy with it, my doctors, and that they were very happy with that and how I was, was recovering. Um, but it hadn't actually uh, shrunk the tumour very much. So it only shrunk maybe 15% of the, at that time, I think it was. So we did targeted radiation afterwards on the... Uh, so I just have a drink. After that, we did targeted radiation on the actual tumor. And that was a cakewalk, really. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that was, um, <coughs> I thought, you know, just the two minute treatment every day for 18 days. And, you know, it was, it was very easy to take compared to our chop. Did leave me a little bit nauseous afterwards, but not too bad. Um, and I was thinking, you know, after that, that I was doing pretty well. And they collected my stem cells and they were really strong. So I was hoping that, okay, this is, okay, I'm, only, I'm still stage two, but I'm in remission maybe. And I keep hearing these stories of, you know, people, uh, you know, they have remission sometimes for 20 years. And I'm thinking, Okay, well, maybe I can do the same thing and I can go back to Japan. Um, and I was, we were hoping that we could do that, even though, like, by the end of that, like, my wife had come back to Australia, she'd given everything away. At least I thought we could go back and start again. But uh, at the end of that, they then put me on a two year program of rituximab. Rituximab is the first bag, first load of treatment from the R chop. It's the actual R in the R chop, and uh, so this would be every two months I have a rituximab treatment uh, just to try and what this the idea is that this will keep you in remission, but also extend your remission period so that after after this two years, hopefully you would get a prolonged remission period. Um, 
And, you know, for yeah, a little while after that, we were, we were doing pretty well health-wise. I, I was stable. I was stage two. I was still dealing with some of the side effects. I had, you know, IBS. I had reflux and, um, you know, a little bit of damage from the uh, chop. Um, and throughout this period, you know, I was like for the first few months with the R chop, of course, I was homeless. I was living in spare rooms and, um, like uh, friends and family sort of living rooms, sort of thing, sleep on the couch and that sort of stuff until my wife came back. And then we, um, because I had a carer, I could then stay in uh, a foundation apartment and we were staying at Leukemia Foundation. So that was one good thing um, that took care of where we had to live. So there was a kind of a lot going on at this period, through this period, you know, being homeless, um, going through treatment, not knowing if I'm going to survive or not, and uh, having to move internationally. And, yeah, so a very stressful sort of period as well. Um, not being able to function because, it, you know, the treatment, I really only got about five days every three weeks where I could actually, where I actually felt almost human again. And, um, yeah, so it just sort of continued from there. We made it through the treatment, which they said was a you know, miracle in itself. And then we started the rituximab. And about a year into that, I was feeling really good. And, um, I decided to, my wife got me back into the gym. I wasn't doing a whole lot, but I was sort of, I was mobile again and I was um, starting to lift and everything just felt really good. And uh, it came back to, like I was having tests done, every time I had treatment, every two months, I was having tests done. So they were, uh, just checking up on making sure everything was good. And I had to have blood tests every week as well. But we got to uh, 2013 in November and I had a, a skid test done, uh, more blood tests and uh, some and a CT scan. And everything is good. So I was thinking, you know, this everything is on track and I'm going to have a good remission here. Um, I'll maybe after this, two years is up, I can go back to Japan again. I was starting to feel really good and positive about it. And, um, and then January 2014, um, the next test came back and I was very high stage four again. So I was like in a two month period that had relapsed and become more aggressive. And basically I was back to square one you know I this just finished two years of treatment and i'm basically back, back where i started so that was really um, demoralizing actually it's kind of you know it was very difficult to take at the time it's like it's almost two years to the day that from the first diagnosis to now and i'm thinking well all through that two years, I'm thinking, okay, they keep telling me like it's a re it's a recurring type of cancer that you can't get rid of. It's always going to be there. But I was always thinking to myself, I'm going to get past this. Once this is done, the treatment's finished. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm good. You know, this is, I'll, I'll be fine, you know. But then it's back again, you know, and I'm still going through treatment, you know, after two years. So that, that was when things sort of crashed for me a lot and I had to sort of think about whether or not I wanted to continue, like keep fighting this sort of thing. Um, so that was probably the worst part, I think. And then my, my oncologist wanted me to start a, a clinical trial as a, a drug called bendamustine. It's not a new drug, but it was just hadn't been used for a while in Australia. And um, it was supposed to be as effective as R-Chart, but 
uh, less invasive, less um, less side effects, not not quite so harsh uh, as the uh, R chop was, not so painful. Um, but it was, and it was uh, less painful. Like the R chop really attacked your, your bone marrow, and like you have white cell injection, so you had a lot of bone pain. So it was um, very different in that respect. But it it left me like after my from my first treatment, it um, it gave me uncontrollable fevers that um, on the first night almost killed me because I, I drove home after treatment, and as soon as I walked through the door, that a fever just hit me that. It, it just kept on climbing. So I, I tried to just, I couldn't stand up properly. I couldn't think or speak. And I just, um, I just wanted to go and sleep it off and just crash. But my wife called an ambulance. And um, by the time I got to the hospital, I was over 42 degrees Celsius. And if I just slept it off, I wouldn't have woken up the next morning because of the inflammation in my brain. So in that respect, it, it was, I, I think it was, it actually became more dangerous than the r chop, And I did that for every treatment afterwards. So they kept me in on, like after each treatment, they kept me in for two to three nights. Um, after the first treatment, um, this would be the norm. Like my fevers would be uh, quite high after each treatment. And from the second treatment, actually during treatment, my fevers would start climbing. So they started treating me for the fevers as well as while, while the treatment's going through. And we got to, um, this was again, like uh, six to eight treatments on a three week basis. So every uh, 21 day cycle. And it went through over two days. So like in, um, day one and day two of treatment and by the time we got to the third treatment it had started filling up my arms that my treatment arm which my left arm with very long thick blood clots um and this this was it i mean it was really thick they kind of made my arm look like a 3d roadmap and so the next treatment after that, they started using my other arm and it did the same thing. So by the time I got to the fifth treatment, both my arms are full of uh, blood clots and they couldn't use it for treatment anymore. So like all the way down from my shoulders, my deltoids right down to my wrist, it was, it was just raised uh, blood clots all the way down. And then they put in uh, a port, they put a put a cath under my skin in my on the right side of my chest to go directly into my heart. Which at the time I was thinking, well, you know, you've just filled up my arms with blood clot. So, you know, is is this really going to be safe for my heart? You know, and they're feeding this stuff and they went directly straight into my heart. And I, I was really concerned that. You know, even though it was just, they, t they told me they were superficial veins, so it's not going to uh, be all that dangerous. But, you know, if it's directly into your heart, I was thinking it might do the same thing. Um, but at the point, at that time, it really, there really wasn't much choice. Uh, so we just went ahead and did it. So I'm in, like, I'm into my third year of treatment and um you know so I, I already had a lot of a fair bit of organ damage already and i you know so thinking about my heart was you know is a bit of the um a catch-22 position i guess but we did it and treatment continued and we got to we did scans along the way after the first three treatments they said it was slow to progress, like to affect the cancer, but they were happy with it. By the time we got to the, the sixth treatment, 
it had, you know, it had stopped working and the cancer was actually growing again. But they continued the treatment to eight anyway, even though it wasn't doing anything. So, but that was the plan, you know, like they started a plan and they didn't deviate, didn't matter whether it was working or not, you know. Um, so the, the cancer was growing and I'm still going through this treatment and I, I was really hoping that, we, you know, the sixth one would be the finish, that the end goal, because it was just, it'd be nothing but trouble since I started it, but they continued to eight. Hoping, I think they were hoping that it would start working late, like the R chop did because that was kind of slow to start working as well. Um, but then after that, it was, um, it had done nothing after eight treatments and they just started to do an autonomous uh, stem cell transplant. So that, um, yeah, I I really had to think about that. I had a couple of weeks between and I was thinking that, you know, it, it really hadn't done it. Like I'm into my third year now of treatment and it really hasn't done anything. So I talked to my oncologist, but he said, without it, it's just uh, like you've got a couple of months at best. And um, yeah, at the time, I really didn't care either way, honestly. like. Uh, it, was, it had been a, a very long, you know, almost, you know, at this point, two and a half years of treatment. And it's uh, it's still, it's just getting worse. So, and they keep telling me that it's, it's only going to get worse from here if I don't treat it. So I'm thinking, well, how much worse can it get, you know? Um, but eventually we went into the transplant and... Um, that was on the 3rd of September. They had to put um, what they call a Hickman line. It was two tubes, like two plastic tubes, again, directly into my heart on the left side of my chest and just hang out and had two uh, little connectors for the treatment to run through. And from there, it was uh, chemotherapy treatment every dose for seven days straight, 24 hours at a time. So I had one bag that ran through over 24 hours and two other bags that ran through over a couple of hours at a time um, for seven days straight. And that, that just absolutely destroyed my body. Just It literally cooked me or microwaves me from the inside out, you know? So from my bone marrow uh, to my organs, I mean, all of my organs, body organs, uh, were totally cooked. And for several months afterwards, the, my skin on the outside was red because it was, uh, because, you know, I looked like a lobster being boiled, you know. Uh, all, the, all the heat and treatment that was coming out of my skin. Um, so in while I was in treatment in in the hospital, I was in hospital for five weeks. It was I couldn't eat. Um, a, a giant. Oh, I had an ulcer in my stomach about the size of a tennis ball. So um, I had no desire to eat, but I, I was also bringing up layers and layers of skin, so layers from uh, like skin from my esophagus and my stomach. Like really thick layers of skin just passing. And yeah, it was, um, it had all the bone pain that the um, arch off had. It left my muscles and connective tissue. Everything was so dry and, and it like, um, it felt like jerky actually. My muscles, everything, you know, when jerky has no, ability to, to stretch or to contract that's what my whole body was like you know um i couldn't 
extend my arms or um, retract them. It just it could not expand at all. So it left me very, very dry, cooked, and unable to think, uh, speak clearly, or or even think about what I was think, you know, speaking. And, you know, I, it left my memory shot completely as well. I had people come and visit. And I, I could never remember even seeing them. Um, and during during the the um, the treatment, the Hickman line itself actually became infected. So they had to quarantine my room. I was already pretty much quarantined. I was in a private room anyway. Um, I didn't allow anyone to come visit. But somehow I got an infection anyway, except for, I mean, except for my wife. She she was the only one who came in, and she was amazing. She she came in early in the morning and she sat with me all day long. And then she went home. She go do a bit of food shopping to tr try and find something that maybe I could eat. And then she would come back the next day. Um, and she did that every day. It was amazing. But. Um, this after this infection they had to remove the hickman line and my heart went aphid and uh, a number of times after the infection i stopped breathing so i'd wake up um, you know i'd have these heart rate monitors on me and they're trying to because my heart was uh, heartbeat was fluctuating so much and so like it was, it was so low that they thought it might have stopped and other times it's just racing too fast. I stopped breathing a number of times and I'd wake up and I had this oxygen mask and breathing stuff going on. Um, and it got to the point where the nurse would come in every 20 minutes just to, just to check on me to make sure I was still breathing. Um, and that was over a 24 hour period. So every, even when I was sleeping, they would come in and wake me up just to make sure I was still breathing again. Um, and you know, that, that sort of left a mark on my wife too, I think, because for years afterwards, she would do the same, you know, if I was sleeping over a long period, she would wake me up just to make sure I was still breathing, you know? Um, and then after that, I went home, uh, finally, uh, after the five week period, um, I could barely walk. I was pretty much walking in a fetal position like with a, a stick and I, like I, I couldn't stand up right because I was like my muscles just couldn't um, expand at all and I was at home I, I could barely I, all I did really was swap uh, the hospital bed for my bed and um, you know I was basically I couldn't it barely even hold a cup I was pretty much just stuck in bed for the next few years. But we were we were just um, between all this happening, like between the the fifth after the fifth treatment, I think it was in the clinical trial. We had to move out of the Leukemia Foundation into our own place. And all we could afford close to the hospital was a tiny studio, just to rent, and. Um, so we did that, and when I went back after when I back went back home uh, in this little studio after the transplant, like it's literally like from the bed to the bathroom and kitchen is two steps, and I couldn't even do that. So, um, you know, I had really um, you know, that was a very difficult transition there. From, from there on. I was pretty much stuck in bed. I couldn't get to the bathroom without help. Uh, I couldn't have a shower and things like that without help. Um, I was I was red all over. I was still passing a lot of skin and the organ damage that it left me with a lot of digestive issues, uh, like severe IBS. Like I was going like to the bathroom ten times a day, you know. Um, it was, uh, I suppose, at first, I didn't think a whole lot about it because I was too sick to move anyway. 
But as I sort of progressed and I, I sort of um, started to get a bit more, you know, started to think a bit, a bit clearer, it, it became very frustrating, very depressing, actually. Um, I couldn't think straight. I couldn't remember talking to people. Well, people would come over and they talked to me for a couple of hours, and then ten minutes later, well, my, my wife would uh, be telling me all about it because I, I didn't remember even seeing them, you know. Um, and this went on for a number of years, actually, um, before I could really walk properly. And, you know, I, I found a lot of that, look, at the time, I didn't understand it very much. But looking back now, after the after the, all this happened, I found that I was, um, like, for the first time in my life, I was craving meat. And for the first time, I didn't really care about the, the fat, you know. Um, Whereas before, like I was always very much into the the health industry. I was a strength coach, so it's always lean, green, and marine sort of diet. So lean meats, low fat sort of diets, you know, and uh, keep your calories down and all that sort of ridiculous nonsense. Um, but afterwards, like I just didn't care because it was like, I mean what does it matter look it's not like it's going to give me more cancer is it so um <clears throat> i would crave meat and i'd get i'd get my wife to cook me a big steak and you know i just uh whereas before i'd cut all the fat off and everything like that now i just eat it um but i i did i do notice that after eating this the meat even though like at the time I could barely hold a knife and fork, um, my body would just soak it up. Like I would, it was like a, a sponge, you know, when a really dry sponge soaks up water, that's pretty much how I felt, you know. I felt like I was soaking up those those fats, you know. And it wasn't until much, <clears throat> it wasn't until some years later that I, I, I really sort of, um, took a bit of notice of that and started thinking about my lymphatic system and and uh, my immune system because um, for many years afterwards it was always a struggle to keep my or to try and boost my immune system um i would always always get a cold or flu very easily and that would that would set me back months at a time um you know, even, you know, a flu would almost kill me and uh, put, me in, put me back in the hospital. So it it really was, uh, I mean, it was, it was kind of dangerous. So we, we pretty much lived in a bubble. You know, every time I went out somewhere, uh, everything had to be cleaned. I had to wash all my clothes. My wife was washing my sheets and my clothes every day, and she did that separately because of the radiation coming out of my body. She couldn't even sleep in the same bed. So, like, for the first year after the transplant, she was actually, and actually through my treatments, she was sleeping on the floor next to the bed because the radiation coming out of my body would would actually infect her, you know. So that's how much was coming out of me, you know. Um, so, because otherwise she would have get gotten radiation poisoning. So that's um, crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was a really tough situation for her as well. Yeah. Um, and then I, I think it took me about two and a half years before I could walk properly again. I couldn't breathe properly at first. I started doing like deep deep breathing exercises about several months after the transplant, um, because the body, my body, just could not move at all. Like muscles, that nothing could expand, including my my lungs, and my breathing, and things like that. So it was a, it was a struggle, um, and then. Eventually, 
Um, after about five years, um, like at that time, I was just eating. I mean, we always ate clean afterwards, especially like through treatment. I couldn't go out to restaurants or eat much junk food or anything like that anyway. And we never liked that much beforehand. It was always home home cooked meals, and um, but it was always. You know, we, I mean, we still had things like cookies and cakes and, you know, we'd have pizza every now and then. But most of that was all homemade stuff as well. Um, and at the time, I really just didn't care what I ate uh, too much because I just figured, I mean, it, I'd taken the expert advice. There's nothing I could do about it. The, it doesn't matter what you eat because it's not going to affect the, the cancer either way. Um, I even had advice that, you know, junk food will, um, is actually good for cancer because it, there's no nutrients to feed the cancer. You know, it's ridiculous nonsense like that. Um, but, You're kidding. You know, yeah, no, no that's, that's some of the advice that we, I got from the hospital. Um, and even while going through treatment, when again, they, like, they'll bring trolleys of food around and it's all candy and cakes and, and soda drinks, right? Um, and even the, the hospital food itself, when you're in overnight, the meals, the so-called meals, are all carbohydrates. Like, there'd be pan, uh, pancakes and there'd be no meat at all. Um, it's just, just sugar, you know? It's, it was absolutely... And I used to joke about it at the time. I was joking about, like you know they feed us this stuff so they can kill us off quickly you know like the food will kill you so they don't have to to treat you you know but at the time it was just a joke but looking back now i'm thinking i'm pretty sure that's what they're trying to do you know um, that's not as funny yeah it's not as funny now yeah it's a very very serious sort of thing you know and they're feeding cancer patients or anyone anyone really because none of this food is healthy for anyone really it doesn't matter what what reason you're in hospital for and you have a look at um the restaurants and the, the vending machines that are in hospital they're all like big corporate junk food you know like coca-cola and all these different so soda drinks and whatnot cakes and cookies and yeah yeah it's ridiculous absolutely ridiculous and then, um, but you know, after after a while, like after five years from that treatment, I mean, I was always kind of looking throughout that period. I, mean, I, I was feeling pretty lucky because I was in remission for that that period, but I was we were always looking for. Um, ways to get off of medications as well so i was trying to find ways to deal with my ibs to deal with um some of the other side effects that i was having because of because of the organ damage like i had, I had a fair bit of abdominal pain and things like that as well and headaches and uh, my immune system was still shot so i was on a lot of antivirals and that sort of stuff as well um and reflux reflux was really bad it was you know, quite severe i was um i was on like three different medications for for reflux all day every day and it, it really didn't um stop it from happening anyway um but you know as we as we went along we found different foods and different things that uh, would help for uh, example like um you know already fermented vegetables like uh sauerkraut you know sauerkraut i found to be very very helpful for ibs and for my stomach issues for reflux um because it's i mean it's, it's just fermented in salt and at the time i i tried it and i thought oh, well, this is really good I didn't really understand why, but I think because it largely because of the salt content. And of course, it's already fermented, so my body didn't have any trouble actually digesting it. 
Then about the five year mark, my wife said, "Maybe you should uh, try come back to the gym." And uh, yeah, because I was feeling pretty good, I started walking, and we we had started going for longer walks, and I could actually keep up with my wife, which was you know in itself just fantastic. Um, and of course, you know the motivation of going back to the gym really helped me to try and uh, focus on. Um, you know, honing my diet a bit more and because I'd been that bedridden for so many years, I'd put on quite a bit of weight, so I was quite chubby. I put on about um, maybe 80 pounds, 90 pounds, I'd say. And, um, you know, the, the, the gym sort of gave me the motivation to try and lose that again and, you know, sort of focus on my diet. I was still in that period of it didn't really matter what I ate because, I mean, it's not going to make me any sicker than what I am. So just eat whatever my wife cooks. And uh, I mean, it was always pretty good, healthy food. But, um, you know, when you're not moving, you, you still put on weight. Um, so I started uh, what uh, a keto sort of style. I mean, I was, I was pretty much already keto, but it was um, moderate carbohydrates and moderate fats and moderate protein. So, you know, from the from the start, it was always like that, you know, um, which I think is really helped me through that period. Actually, it could have been better if I'd been just like a carnival then, but. Um, you know, you live and learn, you know, sometimes it takes a while to learn these things. Um, so I've been doing that for about 10 years now, 10 years in remission. Uh, the last year and a half, I've been strict carnival. But from that period to now, uh, to then, I was pretty much a high fat ketogenic diet. Um, okay. Yeah. So I... <clears throat> The, the biggest change was for me when I when afterwards I started eating a lot more fat, a lot more animal fat. And as I progressed, I, I mean, we always eliminated, we eliminated a lot of, um, you know, processed stuff, uh, you know, through, even throughout the treatment, we didn't, eat, I didn't eat a lot of processed foods either. Um, but I did have protein shakes because it's something I've, I've been on for a long time um, like in the fitness industry trying you know you know taking protein shakes was a normal thing um, but I you know it eliminated that as well so I, I started finding out more and more information about seed oils um, the sugar and sweeteners and um you know deuterium and other things and eventually i just i keep increasing my fat intake my protein intake and just you know eventually just keep dwindling down my, my carbohydrates um and it wasn't until i found sean baker and i thought you know um my wife actually found the carnivore diet and at first i, I thought that was ridiculous because you, you have to have you know fruit and vegetables you know like you know they yeah sure they're carbohydrates but you get a lot of good nutrients with that you know or the same old bs um so it took me a, a couple of months before i you know i thought well maybe i'll give it a try because you know, I, I started looking at sean baker and a few others at ken berry and and you know some of the research that was came out of england as well where they're actually reversing diabetes on the car on the kind of carnivore high fat carnivore diet and i think well you know like I've, I've done pretty well like at that time i was about eight years uh in remission and i, I was thinking yeah i'm on a high fat ketogenic sort of style diet and i've done really well so is there going to be much of a difference um so i thought well it's not going to hurt to try it um and like i said like with diabetes you know it lowers your blood sugar and things like that so it's not gonna hurt um 
So I decided to try it. And from there, it was it, it was a very big difference, actually. And um, reading books like um, The Fiber Menace and, and others, I, I, a lot of aha moments in that period as well. And I'm thinking, yeah, even like the difference between like ketogenic diets kind of like 90 percent there but the carnivore diet that that extra 10 percent um cognitive function wise like a, a, just that cloud of lift you know that everyone has that brain fog lift you know um and other things you know like i was still i had gotten down to just one medication for reflux so i was feeling pretty good but since going carnival, I don't have any medications at all, not even for reflux, not for IBS, not for um, my immune system. My immune system is much stronger now. Um, you know, I take care of my lymphatic system. I have a lot of animal fat. And once you understand that, especially for lymphoma, um, it, the lymphatic system is kind of an interesting subject for me because um, you know, if you understand that it, it's all designed to absorb animal fats, and that's where you get you get fat soluble and water soluble vitamins and nutrients into your lymphatic system, and that needs movement. You know, we we are designed to eat fat and move. You know, that makes such a big difference to your your immune system, to the way you think, the way everything functions. You know, your hormone production and uh, it's been, um, yeah, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a, a long, slow progression, a long, slow sort of, um, but steep learning curve as well. Um, but, you know, from now, I am 10 years remission. Um, I have no treatments. I have um, zero medications. And I... And, you know, I'm in the gym most days of the week. I am exercising every day. And I, I get at least some movement in. And uh, yeah, it's an incredible difference to, you know, in the last 12 years, these so-called experts that I've been listening to for the first couple of years, you know, um, that there, there's no hope for the future. You know, so the, for that, for most of that years, that all these years, our life has been planned six months at a time. You know, um, because it comes down to with follicular lymphoma, every blood test, it could be back. You know, every time they test you, it could be, you know, all right, today it's it's back again, sort of thing. So we haven't been able to plan anything more than that. Our, our, the place where we live now, even um, our apartments along the way, we've had to move several times. But every every lease is a six month lease because anything past that, I might not be around. So it couldn't. We haven't planned any holidays. We haven't planned anything past that because my wife might then have to go back, pack everything up, and then go back to Japan by herself. So. It was very much living just, you know, blood test to blood test um, for the last 12 years until, I mean, the last couple of years because they, they told me I didn't have a future. I didn't have um, a future to look forward to. It was always just more treatments, more and more treatments. But, you know, um, if you... A lot of people probably don't believe it. I know a lot of people don't because you know I've had I have had some comments that you know it's kind of funny actually. At a Facebook group, uh, people with cancer and lymphoma, um, I had some posts about talking about cancer with different doctors that I've interviewed, and a woman complained that um, you know this this these videos are about preventing cancer, you know, like, but because they didn't listen to it, obviously. Um, but, you know, these people all have cancer already, you know, and they're dying. I'm like, 
you know, just because we have cancer doesn't mean that we are dying. You know, it uh, doesn't mean that it's you, you can give up. You, you should give up, or that, um, you know, some people just think that it, it, it can't. You can't manage it. The big C. You know, there's there's nothing you can do about it. Once you've got it, you've got it, and that's it. But you know, for the last ten years, I've managed my blood cancer, my lymphoma, and um, I'm not just like sitting at home and in bed all day or you know just waiting for death to come anymore you know i'm in the gym i'm doing things i'm and i'm trying to show people that you know you can do it too you know you can manage this you can uh there may, may not be a cure but uh, there is a, a way to manage it and there is a way that you can still have a, a life may not be the life you had before but you can still have a life with cancer. Yeah, that your story is that is mind blowing. I mean, there there's so many things that were coming up as you've been talking, and um, that was one thing that I was very curious about. Is you know, obviously, I'm not surprised that your oncology team or your doctors didn't address diet or talk about diet. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like at all throughout the entire process. Um, and then, you know, you're describing the type of food that's in the hospital setting. It's like, again, there's this complete disconnect between some of the most fundamental aspects of how our bodies heal and function and, and how we are designed to thrive, um, and be healthy. Like, where is like, why is that component missing? And that's so frustrating. I can only imagine now you looking back on this and wondering like, what if, somebody had, what if you had found this information 10 years ago, you know, would it, would it have, where would you be today? Or, you know, how would that have affected your, you know, your outcome? Um, but what, what a crazy transformation. I'm so, so happy to hear that you're doing so much better now, obviously, and you're, you're getting your life back. Um, is that kind of why it's DC learning to live? What does that mean to you? And why, like, why is that well, sort of your, your handle there? Well, because I don't, I don't think anyone's an expert on life. Right? We're all just learning to live as we go. We there's going to be ups and downs, and but we, you know, we, we learn as we go, and we, we learn from our mistakes. We learn from um, you know other people's mistakes too, hopefully. And you know, basically, I'm starting again. You know, I'm I'm 51 years old now. I've lost the last 12 years to treatments and things like that. But, um, yeah, I'm just learning to live again. I'm learning to start again and just learning to sort of get through life again, you know. So I'm hoping that I can um, maybe take my wife back to Japan and start again there as well. Um, so we, we, we're still in that um is it you know are we is it is it safe now is it is it good to go sort of thing and can i get on with my life but it's also like it's also given me a bit of a mission like you said <clears throat> what would it be have been like if i had found this information long before like 12 years ago when i first started treatment or even earlier you know or maybe i could have prevented it completely um you know, it would have been great, uh, but it wouldn't. Um, I, I feel like I'm blessed also because of the trials that I've been through, that I have that experience that people will hopefully learn from and people can um, m maybe make changes for themselves, even if they are, um, even if they are already diagnosed with a disease. It doesn't mean that it's over and it doesn't mean that you can't change the outcome and it doesn't mean that you can't make it better from there like i i really just want people to understand that you can still make improvements as well so in that respect that's why i call it learning to live because we're really that's all we're all doing that's we are all just learning to live as we go we don't i, I don't think anyone's an expert it doesn't matter if they're a billionaire or you know um, someone living in the street you know there's just uh you know and learning 
for me, I think should be a, a lifelong journey. You know, it's every day we should be trying to learn as until we, the day we die, hopefully. Just keep on learning. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Um, sort of along that line, what do you, because, you know, we still hear all the time that like red meat is associated with cancer, obviously saturated mm -hmm. fat and cancer and bowel disease in particular and things like that. But um, it seems like many of us on this carnivore side are discovering that perhaps the opposite is, opposite is true. And so did you have any sort of reservations about eating more fat, eating more red meat, things like that? Or it sounds like yeah. you were sort of following your cravings and were like, hey, I've, I've been through enough. I'm not going to restrict my diet. But what do you say to people who are like, well, you know, don't you know, red meat causes cancer? Yeah. Um, yeah, I had my reservations too at first. Um, like I said before, it's like, you know, that, that's, that when I first heard about carnival itself, I was like, that's ridiculous. You got to have your your veggies and fruit, that sort of stuff. Um, but um, you know, there are five major organs all designed to absorb fat. Okay, not oils. Okay, not seed oils. Fat, animal fat. Um, the largest being your liver. Okay, and fat. And of course, you know there are major uh, hormones produced from your your liver in your lipids, not cholesterol, because it's lipids, um, such as testosterone and D3 and, and others. Um, when, when you understand that, there is, uh, there is no logical reason why anyone would think that meat would be bad for you. You know, we've, been, we've survived on it for the last four and a half million years, at least. Um, and I think a lot of that is just, it comes down to, uh ignorance which i was i was ignorant to it as well um and um obviously um the wrong education and propaganda because you know i was very much fat phobic i was very much fat i would cut the 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 fat off any sort of meat that i got i would always i ate a lot of lean chicken breast and turkey breast and that sort of stuff and uh, that sort of also leads to protein poisoning, okay, what they call rabbit, rabbit starvation. You know, so you can, you can eat a lot of food and a lot of protein, um, for example, on a low-fat diet and still be mal malnourished okay, because you're not getting those, those fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients that your body craves and needs, okay, that your brain needs. Okay. Um, but I've, I've reversed a lot of damage to my heart. Uh, you know, like afterwards I had many tests done on my heart because I was AFib and, um, you know, basically my heart was cooked and it, it had, a, you know, three years of chemotherapy pumping through my heart. Okay. It does a lot of damage and uh, not just to, to my heart, but also to my brain and to the rest of my, my organs. Um, and, you know, for the longest time, you know, I believed the, the same education, you know, in college, it was all about calories and, uh, you know, eat low fat, saturated fat is bad for you and all this sort of stuff. But saturated fat is also in uh, carbohydrates as well. It's also in, you know, the, the oils that people like to eat as well, like muffins and uh, donuts and all that sort of stuff as well. But, um, you know, it's actually very little saturated fat in meat as well so it's really just about uh, finding the right information and putting it to use um and you know until recently my my even my oncologist my oncologist is a great guy really nice guy um but he just and the the rest of the team they're good people problem is they're just they are not educated on nutrition and they basically, doctors are, they will identify a disease and identify the drug that treats that disease. And that's it. They just put those two together. All right. Um, unfortunately, they don't do enough research into or education into what causes the disease um, and how nutrition plays a role. Uh, and 
uh, until recently, I spoke with my oncologist about um, my condition because they they think I'm a miracle. They think I'm like it shouldn't have happened. I shouldn't be in remission. I shouldn't be doing so well and so healthy. I should be on medications and all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, at one stage they were planning to keep me in a wheelchair. You know, for the rest of my life. Um, even after the the stem cell transplant because that's that was what i yeah. kind of wanted to know was like what was the what was their prognosis for how that was supposed well, to turn out yeah, and so yeah even for the transplant the prognosis was that like they were they didn't even expect me to survive the transplant even though they were they still wanted me to go through it because there was an off chance that if i did i might get a remission period but okay. They didn't expect me to even even survive the remission period. They were surprised that I did, especially after the infection and everything that went wrong. Um, and then afterwards, they didn't expect me to live long afterwards anyway. Um, so the prognosis uh, for each each treatment was not very positive. Um, and uh, and like I said before, like recently. I was speaking to my oncologist about um, because he wanted to know what I was doing differently, he wanted to know what changes I'd made. Um, and he himself, his father, was, who was also a doctor, had reversed diabetes by just eating meat and eggs, um, which was, you know, for my mind, was, it was impressive that his father thought of that and did that uh, and that he was doing that. But he he never thought to I, I when you're stuck in the public hospital system too, whether you're a doctor or patient, it's very difficult to make any changes, you know. So it's not like he can just suggest this to his patients to eat because he would be ostracized too. Um, but I don't think he really 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 ever thought about it in terms of treating cancer either. So it's just um, an education thing too, you know. But um, yeah. yeah, there you go. I guess right. And and going back to kind of what you said about being having gratitude for the experience that you had, even though it was, it, you know, sounds absolutely horrific to me. Um, you know, think about that seed that's now been planted with yeah. all those people that watched you go through that and treated you and, you know, right. uh, they probably had the best of intentions, you know, but like, these are yeah, the yeah. tools, these are the tools that they had. And now to know like, Oh, this guy, you know, he's doing great. He's getting his life back. He's exercising again. He's on no medication and he did this weird diet. Right. Or maybe not so weird. Cause he, his father kind of did the same thing, but you know, now, now there's that seed. And what if somehow, that information gets spread to somebody else, you know, where it may never have before. So I think that's so powerful. And I think it's um, so commendable that you can look back and look, look back on your experience like that, because it could be really easy to sort of fall into playing the victim all the time, or, you know, always feeling, feeling sorry about uh, what's happened, but it sounds like you, you really have a hopeful outlook and, that's sort of the other thing that I wanted to ask about because I kind of the theme for for my whole thing is become who you are, right? And I know that nutrition plays such a huge role in that because when we can separate ourselves from all these, you know, in my case, addictions in the past and and having chronic digestive problems and and brain fog and anxiety and all these things, it's like now I'm starting to realize who I really am without all of that baggage. And I'm almost, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of years and, and it's taken me that long to kind of get to this place. And so I imagine any, you know, like your experience has probably taught you a lot about who you are. And I've noticed that throughout this conversation, you know, you've had this, this attitude of never giving up and like, there's always hope. So where do you, where do you think you got that from? Or where does that come from? Whereas you might see other people in that same circumstance sort of feel like, well, there's nothing I can do or I'm going to give up. Um, well, you know, I mean, it's hard to say. 
I mean, I, I, I've had my moments though too, you know, like, um, I have had, I've had those periods where, uh, like I couldn't move. I was stuck in bed. Um, I was had nothing but pain, you know, all day long. And that wears you down, you know, um, there were some days where it was just, it was depressing just waking up, you know, um, and I think everyone, everyone will go through that sort of thing. If you, if you are in pain long enough, if you're going through some kind of illness, um, it, it does wear you down. And, um, you know, the food is also a big part of that as well. If you're eating things like seed oils and, you know, processed foods, you know, you're going to be a pretty negative person anyway, I would, I would imagine, because, I mean, even before all this, you know, I had my, even when I was fit, lean and getting on with life, I had my moments of depression, you know, right? why isn't this working sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I put that down to the, the processed food and the lack of fat in the, in the diet. Um, and, yeah, I've just started an, another good book actually by Georgia Ede, and she's talking about that, um, change your mind, change, change your diet, change your diet, change your mind. Um, but, um, I mean, they're just moods, you know, like they're, they're moods of depression. And, you know, I, I, where I, one day I might wake up and I'll say, oh, damn it, this is so depressing. Why, why I'm, I'm, I'm awake again? I've got to go through another day of this, like more pain. How long is this going to last? That's, you know, th this is what I was feeling at the time. Like some days it'd be, you know, how much longer do I have to put up with this? Why, you know, either die, okay, just get on with it, bring it on, or, you know, let me get on with my life. That was, I would literally argue with myself, you know, either either crap or get off the pot, you know. Um, you know, if, if you're dying, do it, just do it now. Uh, you know, just give me a heart attack, anything, just do it now. Otherwise, let me get on with my life. This was the kind of argument I would have with myself, you know. Um, and eventually, like, when you, when you start noticing some progression, like, and it, it does take time. When, when you, especially at the time, it feels like it's going very slow. So when you look back, at the progression can actually, it's quite a short period, quite a, you know, like, I don't look at this last 10 years as being that long really at the time when i first started it was very slow and very long yes each day was very slow but when you look back on it and you think well wow, that went really quick you know um so there were days where i was like that and that then there were other days where you know i would be like well i'm feeling pretty good you know this is this is getting better i'm feeling better um, maybe I can do something with this after all. Maybe something will happen. You know, like it can't be, you know, it can't rain every day, right? So I just keep, I don't think that even though I did go through the depressing times, I, I always still have that thinking about the future. Look, I, I keep thinking about, okay, what am I going to do? Um, I keep planning for myself and my wife and I'm thinking, all right, I've got to find a way to make, to make money. I've got to find a way to start living again. I've got to, I've got to do these things. And I think that has helped me as well, as much as anything, having things to do. Um, even though like, even from the first year, like when we, we found that we, um, when I first diagnosed, then I had to move internationally. I had to loot. We lost everything. Then I still, well, my wife was in Japan. I had to set us up in Australia while I was going through treatment and I was homeless. I had to find us a place to live. I had to find us, a, I had to find a way for my wife to come into the country and stay with me. I had to find a way to get money rolling in. I had to find, I had to set up bank accounts. I had to get a driver's license. I had to set up a whole new life in a different country. You know, even though it was my home, my home country, I hadn't lived here for 10 years. So I had to reset everything up. I always had to do something. 
um and it was either you know i didn't have the choice of just laying there and doing nothing because things needed doing um and it now it's the same is um I don't have the choice. I, I'm not giving myself the choice of just laying there and doing nothing and, and being depressed all the time because uh, I have things that I have to do, you know. Um, so that's that's why I think I'm just not done yet. I And that's something – actually, people do ask me that, what keeps me going, and I think – and I just tell them straight, you know, I, I still have things I want to do. That's – as simple as it is, that's, I think, one of the biggest reasons, that's one of the biggest things that's keep me going. I still have things in life that I want to do. I want to travel. I want to go see different countries. I want to, I want to meet different people. I want to do things that, um, you know, if I just stay in bed and wait for death, I can't do it. So for me, that's, I mean, that argument is always there, though. I mean, there's always that part of you um that you know there's there's always that like that fat lazy slob inside of all of us that wants to just sit there watch tv and eat pizza all day you know you have to fight you have to really argue with yourself like get your ass off the off the lounge get up go to the gym you know go outside get some sunlight go for a run do whatever you know you have to get i think we all go through that struggle you know but I think yeah, I agree. Uh, I think the difference is that some some people lose that battle. But me, I, I will go to war with myself. You know, I get up and, and move. These things have to be done. So I think that's really helped, actually. I don't know really where that comes from, but I think it's just, um, yeah, that, I mean, the simplest answer is that I just, I still have things I want to do. And I'm not going to, I'm not just going to give up and say, oh, I can't do them. I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep trying to do them. Whether I get them done or not, I'm going to keep trying to, to do them. I wanted to mention too how obviously your wife has been such a huge part of this, right? It, you know, it sounds like she she's been with you every, every step of the way and has gone above and beyond to support you. Um, so I'm sure you know, obviously that makes a huge difference. What, what is, um, like how, how has that relationship sort of fed into that with, with keeping you motivated and keeping you excited about your future? Um, well, you know, from the start when I was first diagnosed, um, I, I, I offered her a way out. I said, look, this is my problem this is um this is only going to get worse if if you, when you go back to japan if you decide not to come back it's okay with me i'm I'm fine with that and i i told her that i like maybe when this is when this is over i'll come back to japan and we can start up we can pick up again um and she just looked i mean i actually three different occasions i told her to you know, I would be fine with it. And each time she just told me you should stop being stupid, you know. And um, she never once hesitated. Now, that in itself is remarkable. But since then, we have been together all day, every day for the last 12 years. You know, um, the longest time we spent apart was the two weeks that I I went to I came to Australia for the for my vacation, um, and you know like most relationships don't really last that kind of that much contact you know but we spent we I mean the last twelve years I think we spent you know pretty much twenty four hours a day together and that's kind of like three three lifetimes of marriages really. Um, you know, we've this year is 20 years together, uh, married 21 years together, and 20 years married this year, this October. Actually, October this year is uh, two anniversaries for me, is 
our 20th anniversary and 10 years remission. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's, and it, you know, it's, um, it's a remarkable how strong she has. Be- I mean, she has become that strong because of everything that we've, be- we've come, we've come through together. And I know this kind of thing can drive a lot of people apart. I've seen it happen. I've seen uh, relationships break up because of this kind of diagnosis. Um, But for us, it's just brought us closer together because we both appreciate how much the, how much we've lost, how much we've been through, and how much uh, effort that we have we have both put in together to to try and keep this together as well. and I won't say that like they haven't not it's not like there haven't been bad times, like apart from um all the struggles, you know, there's been a lot of emotions go in, involved in that too. You know, we've had our fights, we've had our, you know, all sorts of emotions uh, along the way where and disagreements of you know, because of you know, frustration, the things that run rise out of frustration too, you know. Um, but yeah, we, we very much like each other's company as well, you know, and, uh, I think that's, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, I, I can't really explain it, but it's a, a, probably the closest, um, I mean, we're very happy to, to be by ourselves as well. You know, we don't socialize very much. Um. And I think from my mind, like, I just appreciate how much that she's done for me and how much she's gone through for me. Because at the time when I was first diagnosed, diagnosed like, it was, it's only been, it was only eight years that we'd been married. And that eight years was very busy, you know, um, living in Japan. And, uh, you know, we, we came and stayed in Australia for a little while too, through that period. But, uh, you know, so most of the most of our marriage so far has been me in treatments um which is very difficult i think for any partner to have to sort of go through as well so i i really do appreciate that just how much um she has supported me through that period you know through you know so far as well so. yeah that's absolutely incredible um yeah very much um we kind of, I have sort of three questions that uh, I kind of like to wrap up with um, yeah, sure. talking to you about. We've sort of mentioned the first one, uh, talking about just like things that you've learned, uh, some books that you mentioned. But like if you if you had a favorite book that you could recommend, uh, you think people should read health-wise or otherwise, uh, what would it be? Um, that's difficult. I like... I like um, health-wise, okay, um, health-wise, I think two books come to mind. Uh, the, the Fat of the Land by um, Wilhelm Stephenson is really good. Um, he was an Arctic explorer and researcher that uh, he spent a lot of time in the Antarctic with uh, the river people and uh, the Inuit. Uh, he was also uh, on the carnivore diet himself for six years plus, just just meat and fat. Um, very good. And I think he's someone I think a lot of people would, would find very interesting as well. Um, and the book I'm reading at the moment, um, the, the Fiber Menace as well, um, is just a brilliant book. It really is very good. And I think a lot of people will have a lot of aha moments about uh, their diets and uh, how it affects them. Um, but I think if it's uh, health-wise, you'll get a lot more understanding of your body if you understand your lymphatic system um, and what, it's, what it actually does and, and how you actually you, uh, help your lymphatic system by moving uh, which is something that I'm actually writing about as well, um, which I will be doing after my, after this, I have 
I actually am writing a book at the moment, but not so much more about experience than than diet. But my next book is about the um, our effect on uh, the lymphatic system. So I think if you understand that, that's going to give you a very good understanding of uh, health, what your diet should be, and uh, our lifestyle should be. Because it's not just about food; um, it's also about lifestyle. You need you need movement um and you need the sun you know everything that everything that's uh, demonized these days is absolutely essential for health you know exactly like, <laughs> yeah yeah you know like fat cholesterol sunlight for example grounding you know um and deep breathing exercises um these are all you know uh life hacks that i use uh, deep breathing was my first one. It's the first one that helped me get moving again. Um, and of course, a high fat diet, uh, sunlight, and grounding are absolutely essential as well. Um, and timing, timing is another good thing. Like having your body clock set to the circadian rhythm, set to the sun, is is really important as well. So these are these are things that I think. Uh, essential for people to understand and it might sound like it's a lot of information and it's a lot to do and that sort of thing but it's actually really quite simple you know just you know four or five simple acts a day will change your whole life you know and it can be done in less than 30 minutes a day you know so that's what i would advise anyway that, yeah, that's actually something I, I did mean to ask was sort of kind of in two parts, like since you came from a fitness background and now you've learned so much more about, especially the lymphatic system and how movement is essential for that because there's no pump, right? It's just movement is the pump. Um, that's about all I know about it, but. The lymphatic system relies on the um, the, the musculoskeletal system to, as a pump. Is it is is the pump for your lymphatics like i said pump that lymph fluid around your body it needs the muscles to circulate the lymph fluid um but you know it's also the same for your uh your blood system when uh like for venous return in your blood as well you still rely on the contraction of your lower limb muscles your, your calves and to pump that blood back up to the rest of your body as well and the lymph your lymphatic system is the same so you know um conditions like lymphedema and lipedema and things like that it's a lack of circulation basically so have you like has your movement routine changed in any way now since like maybe pre-diagnosis when you were in the gym like is there anything in particular that you do in that regard um, not really um i mean i was always i was always very active um beforehand i was very lean fit i just wasn't healthy i thought i was healthy because i was lean and fit you know i had six back abs and uh, everything was good um i am probably less active now um than i was before but um, now I'm sort of more focused on uh, joint stability, joint health, and um, you know. Whereas before I was young, I didn't I didn't bother about warm ups and that sort of thing, you know. Um, but coming from a, a position where this is another reason why I think I'm blessed in that, um, even though I, I did study re rehabilitation and strength and conditioning you don't know what it feels like until you can't move you know and i spent years in bed where i could not move i couldn't i couldn't uh, like like i say i couldn't even hold a cup all right so um learning how to move again and uh, rehabilitating my joints knowing how that feels is very different to prescribing exercise um and um, trying to get back in the gym without any injuries, um, you know, that that can be a, a very big struggle for many people. And a lot of trainers, especially young trainers, don't understand 
uh, you know, the, the vast majority of people now are a sedentary um, population. They have uh, a lot of body weight that they can't support on their joints and just starting on weights and, and starting on um, exercise like compound movements and things like that, that actually creates a lot of injuries and it, it really is very difficult for people to to get back to a um, well to a, a to a point where they can just go hit the gym as hard as they can oh. i mean you have to build a foundation and it can be quite difficult it can take time but you'll you, it's like um building the foundation on a house you know if you if you want to have a good looking house and and, uh, and it's all about longevity right if you want to have, have a good looking house that stays there for 100 years then you need to build a good foundation you know um and a lot of people don't understand that as well so and i think i have a much better understanding of that now because i've had to do that myself um especially coming from um a point where i couldn't move i couldn't move my my legs my feet very well at all um so it's i think that's really helped me that way uh, so i spend more time uh, thinking about actual mobility and range of motion and and moving that way so uh, whereas before when i was younger i just went and did it and now i sort of you know think about how to make it how, how to make it better and how to make it how to improve it you know yeah absolutely and and you're so right about the the majority of the population right and then we have this sort of oh same thing with diet losing weight it's like oh let me just transform my whole life in 30 days and you know get yeah. in the gym and do all this crazy stuff and then you end up getting hurt and then then how far long are you out of moving at all really from trying to recover from that yeah. injury so I think it's yeah, very dubious uh, people that offer you the offer you the, you know 30 days to your dream body sort of ridiculous nonsense especially to a sedentary person um and it's yeah i think it's more detrimental than anything actually did you find um like putting muscle on has been like how's that been since you've been carnivore maybe versus the high fat keto and obviously now there's more variables like adding in more movement and stuff but how do you feel like you're recovering in that regard um well you know, like even from going from a high high fat carnival to uh, sorry high fat keto to carnival, I actually lost a lot of uh, body fat. Um, and you know, when you I mean when you're putting on muscle, when you are like eating carbs, um, you you put you put on a lot of volume, um, but you don't actually put on a, a lot of muscle. Like it'll still be uh, you get a lot of um, adipose tissue as well um, and you get even though you have that sort of volume and you look big a lot of it is actually um, it's kind of water as well so you, you, you can actually lose quite a bit of that and still still keep that that same muscle amount so I found that I did when I did go to street carnival I found that I wasn't eating enough and I find that most people do that when they start carnival, they they don't eat as much because they, they try and keep the same portions of meat. Um, but so I did lose a bit of weight. I lost a bit of uh, muscle and things like that. But after a while, I started realizing, like, okay, I need to increase my portions. Uh, that All that just comes back on very, very quickly. And if you've been... At any point in your life, if, if you've been um, uh, quite muscular or big or anything like that, that muscle always comes back very quickly. So it's not like if you did like 10 years of um, any kind of sport, um, say 20 years ago, had a, had a break, and then you um, went back to it, that you're going to find it doesn't take that 10 years to get it all back again. Like it'll come back in a couple of years. And it will come back pretty quick. Um, 
The difference is, though, between carnivore and, say, ketogenic diet is that when you put on muscle, it is lean muscle. Okay? Um, whereas if on, carn on ketogenic, you'll put on volume, but it won't be lean muscle. You know? um, so you, you, you get that kind of round, puffy-looking muscle. And a lot of people like that, a lot of bodybuilders like that. And they think that that's why they have their, um, you know, their bulking period. Some people will have their bulking period where they eat a lot of carbs and they, they bulk up sort of thing, uh, which I, I think for my mind is just a complete waste of time and uh, it's very unhealthy for most of them. Um, yes, they get big, right? but that doesn't mean that they're putting actually putting on a lot of muscle. Okay. Um, so I, I think if you're going to bulk, for example, if you're going to try and bulk on the carnivore diet, just eat more meat. Uh, you know, you, you, your muscles are made up of amino acids and we don't, we don't actually, that's the whole protein thing too. You know, and when people talk about uh, protein, they say, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, protein is protein. All that sort of stuff. They're talking about crude protein. Our, our body doesn't absorb crude protein per se late so right like plant, plant proteins and things like that we, we absorb amino acids and peptides you know that we get from meat yeah so if you want to be stronger and for my mind i think strength is better than muscle mass better than bodybuilding like okay? strength training is much more important because uh, you want to have strength through any range of motion Right? You want to have strong joints. You want to have. You want to be strong in any kind of range of motion, so that you don't injure yourself. You know, um, and you know, I I, I like uh, things like calisthenics and um, you know, even you know gymnastics and all all these different sports that promote uh, this kind of like strength through range of motion because it. It's a more human uh, movement uh, to be able to do things in a different in a different way. So that even when you are working, uh, if you are you know, working on a hammer or or at work, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in an office job or any other kind of job. You want to you don't want to be uh, worried about injuries. You want to be able to perform whatever task you need to be able to do. Um, so you know that that for my mind is is more far more important for longevity than say uh, being a bodybuilder for ten years for you know, have looking big. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm totally on the same page. I've been practicing yoga for a long time, and I sort of took a break this last year when I switched over to carnivore because I was so tired um, that I couldn't even like short workouts would just sort of burn me out for the rest of the day. So, um, and I missed, but I missed it so much and I've just started adding it back in and it really is, it's that functional, like I feel so different. My body is so different now from yep. not even doing that for a year, but I know it is kind of like you said, um, even just in these first couple of weeks, it's like, it's already starting to come back because my, it's been so entrained into my, into my body from all the years in the past. And so yeah, that's, that's really what I'm trying to focus on too, is like solid functional strength. So, and that's what we want as we age, right? We want to be able to still put on our own pants and, you know, walk up and down stairs and lift grocery bags and rotate and do all those right. basic functional movements so that we can be independent and, you know, take care of ourselves into, into elder, you know, old age and things like that. So that's awesome. Um, one of the one of the worst things worst advice uh, i've seen people give though is when when someone is sedentary and people would tell them oh you know don't worry about lifting weights just do body weight exercises most people sedentary they can't lift their body weight you know this is something that needs to be worked up to okay you, know, you ever try to lift your body like doing a pull-up that's the same as doing a pull-up most people cannot do pull-ups Okay. Mm -mm. <laughs> so telling people just oh just do body weight exercises that's ridiculous okay um you know when you're sedentary you need to work you need to strengthen your joints you need to build up to you need to strengthen yourself somehow 
to to work yourself up to body weight exercises you know and that that's just like it just it drives me nuts when people say oh just do body weight exercises you know have you have you seen how heavy some of these people are you know like right right yeah. no definitely and there's i think that is a part that's missed very often it's people think oh body weight is is really easy, you know, and, and everybody should kind of be able to, to start there. But no, I think very, very deconditioned people, uh, definitely mm. need, need that work up, uh, with the joint strengthening for wow. sure. So, yeah. um, I mean, we've kind of gone over some great, you've given some great advice already. Um, and some great concepts, I think that, that apply to health and also kind of just to life in general. But, um, if you had to sort of sum up like the most important piece of advice that you could give somebody, um, what do you think that would be? All right. Well, okay. So you can, you can tell from my story, I've been through a lot of stress and I think um, a lot of people these days are literally stressing about stress, right? They're stressing about avoiding stress. It's such a big thing. They're worried about fat loss, for example, and producing cortisol. You know, cortisol is a natural hormone that you produce in the morning when you it's a, it's your wake up hormone right and there's a difference between good stress and like positive stress and negative stress and for example all right so a diagnosis like mine okay that's a negative negative stress okay going through that treatment that's a negative stress but a positive stress is setting yourself a goal and trying to achieve it, trying to get things done, having things to do and getting them done. Okay. It can be a stressful thing. Um, but that's a positive stress, you know. Um so don't worry um so much about trying to avoid stress for a start. Um don't worry too much about what other people think of you. I mean, really, we're all just like I said, we're all just here learning to live. No one's an expert on life. We're going to make mistakes. Um, and you learn from those, those, those mistakes. That's what they're there for, you know. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, things happen. And, you know, if you, if you can figure out why these things happen, you can figure out how to avoid them next time, you know. Um, so for my mind, like, sometimes... Even when everything and everyone around you is telling you to give up or it's not going to work or um, it, it, there's nothing that can be done, okay, you, you might have to go it alone and that's okay. That's all right. Don't be afraid to go against the grain. Don't be afraid to uh, try and don't be afraid to, um, you know, go just – your own path just stick to your own path and and there's always going to be negative people around you like like you know it can't it can't work it you know doesn't matter what you do sort of thing but you know a lot of that is just that you know when when they say it can't be done it's because they haven't seen it they just haven't seen it done yet you know like when the first person um you know broke the uh you know the the four minute mile sort of thing you know after that you know many people did it yeah you know? so it's just a case of knowing or just have faith in yourself and just keep going and uh you know if even if you fail it doesn't matter it does not matter at all so don't stress about it don't stress about stressing, just relax, you know, get on with it. And you make mistakes, we all do. Um, it's really just a matter of picking yourself up and uh, keep going, keep trying, basically. I love that. That's awesome. Yes, and applicable to pretty much everything, <laughs> which I love. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about uh, – some things that you want to do in the future and perhaps traveling. Um, so something I ask everybody is, you know, where would you love to go and why? Um, so where would you like to travel? 
Um, well, it's, you know, it's always three favorites for me. Um, one's America, um, another one's Poland, and of course, I want to go back to Japan. Um, mostly, I, I like living in Japan. It's a lot of fun. It's very easy to live in Japan. Um, uh, it's very cheap compared to Australia, but um, yeah, there's. I mean, it's the thing I love about the, those three countries is that one, they are all freedom-loving people. Um, they have a beautiful history. They have. Um, I love architecture as well. They have a lot of a lot of different uh, parts of the, those three cultures that I very much enjoy. So. Those are three of my favorite places that I would uh, like to return to and and explore more about. So, yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story today and talking with me. It was it's been a great conversation. I think it's very inspiring, very cool. and um, I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. Uh, tell us about your channel before we uh, sign off for today, and I've, I'll leave links to everything that you mentioned in the description for people to go and subscribe. But, um, yeah, give us a little bit of a preview of what we can expect on your channel. Okay. Uh, so the channel is called DC Learning to Live. Um, and as I explained before, because, you know, we're all just basically learning to live. But me at the moment, I'm just learning to live again and get my life back on track. Um, but uh, you know, hopefully I can give people uh, maybe a little bit of inspiration, hopefully, um, some good information, hopefully, as well. I've been, I interview a lot of different doctors and uh, a lot of different people, their stories of healing as well. Um, and, you know, hopefully, um, I'll also give you a little bit of information about my journey my, as I get my test done and uh, I'll be as I said, like October would be my 10th year anniversary from my remission. And uh, next month I'm getting some more tests on. So I'll be doing talking a bit about that as well. Um, but also uh, some tips and tricks on um, life hacks, exercise, uh, nutrition, and uh, yeah, that's about it, I guess. Hmm. So, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Are you just on YouTube or do you frequent any other platforms? Yeah, yeah I'm on um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and I, I also have the same videos up on Rumble and Brighton as well. So, yeah. Pretty awesome. much everywhere. Okay, well, I will. Okay. <laughs> well, I will leave links to all the ones that I can uh, find or you can send them all to me. Uh, below. So make sure everybody to go subscribe and keep up with DC's videos. Thank you so much again for the talk today. Um, hope you all enjoyed the episode and we'll see you soon for another video. Take care, everybody. See you.